Oh, home cooking always does you good, man. It's good to be back. Rangers are back home. They get a nice W last night at the Garden against the Coyotes. And uh, especially after coming off of a home opener like that, nothing more than ice in your veins and gets (laughs) your blood pumping and uh, all the good stuff. Welcome to Up in the Blue Seats. I'm Andrew Hartz, and uh, we've got a huge, huge episode for you, more than usual. I mean, again, we're talking about the Rangers opening road trip. We're talking about the home opener. We're talking about Igor, ice in his veins, 4-4-4 four, four, four on penalty shots. But we have so much to discuss, and to do that, we're going to bring in, of course, the great Rangers beat writer from the New York Post. It's Molly Walker. Molly, how you doing? I'm good, Andrew. How are you? We're doing good. <laughs> we're smiling. We're happy. Hockey's back. We're having a fun time. But before we can even do that, I mean, we got to do some pretty, pretty big news here. Mm-hmm. Coming on the show for the first time ever. And we are so, 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 so happy to have him aboard on the Up in the Blue Seats podcast crew. Man, I don't even know where to begin. I mean, you know, this this guy, former Ranger, former devil, former uh, the Tampa Bay Lightninger. Lightninger, is that it? I don't know. Lightninger? <laughs> but, but hey, listen, uh, he, he's a fighter. He's he's a, a big, big, big name that we brought on to the podcast. It's none other than former Ranger great Brian Boyle. Brian, welcome to the Up in the Blue Seats podcast. How you doing, man? So glad to have you here, and I uh, hope you're as excited as we are to have you. I'm thrilled. Thank you. Thank you for that intro as well. <laughs> it's nice to hear nice things said about you sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm being ordered around at home quite a bit and, uh, by my children. Uh, it's been, uh, I'm excited to do this, kick it off. Love the Rangers, love my time there. Uh, we'll be back in New York a lot this year too. And Excited to see what Lavi's got in store for this squad. I, uh, I like what I saw last night for sure. Mm. Well, listen, there's going to be a lot to get from you. There's so much to talk about your hockey career, your time here with the Rangers, your time on the championship team, whatnot, you know, that took us to the Stanley Cup finals. Um, But we're going to see you a bunch on the MSG network. We're going to hear you a bunch on the NHL network. So uh, we're just lucky to have you aboard with us. Tell us, like, what's been the big transition like for you going from off the ice to now behind the microphone have you always thought that that you wind up in this spot here talking doing a podcast with molly walker i did i did it was uh it's a dream come true no i look i i i love the game and it is no i'm i'm very thankful that you guys reached out and uh excited you know what i'm real excited to have to a team to follow closely and i, and I follow players and I definitely follow the Rangers. I follow Tampa quite a bit, you know, places, the devils, the places that I had really nice experiences. And, um, but you know, I wasn't a player when I got to New York and I left uh, an established player and I had New York to thank. I wish I could have stayed. Um, they didn't really want me. I don't think, but it was, uh, <laughs> it was, you know what, it was a great five years and the transition is never, ever going to be easy. Uh, I don't care who you are, uh, unless you just were that talented and you didn't like the game. You know, as a player, we just – you you do everything to get as good as you can. Your life revolves around it. I'm thankful for that because I really loved it, the hard the hard parts of it I loved, you know. So when it's over, it's over, and you you got to re-identify yourself or find, you know, what it is that you can do all day. Um, <laughs> and, and doing the NHL Network stuff was awesome. Like, they – Bringing me in, it was I was really fortunate for that. But, you know, you talk about every team and you can't, I'm not, you know, it's an unbiased take, which is, which is fine. And it truly is, but um, a little homerism, a little team to root for. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I miss that. And I have it with the uh, 2015 Breakers Elite team, but the Bay State Breakers in mm-hmm. third place right now. Uh, but <laughs> uh, yeah, big step up from last year, but um I don't get to play. So I get, you know, there's nothing like playing, but it's exciting to have a chance to certainly uh, root for a team and be a part of a small part of uh, that great organization that I love so much. Did you always think that you could be a media personality? Is that something that you thought of while you were a <laughs> no. player? <laughs> no, no, no. I I am trying to improve on a number of things. <laughs> And I, I did have people, some people say maybe, and, and that'd be something you could maybe do, but it was always like my aunts and my mom. Cause you know, your aunts and your mom think you're <laughs> the best. A, lot great, yes. a lot greater than you probably are. <laughs> and, 
so I, you know, I, but I love talking about hockey. I love mm. watching hockey. And, you know, the first few months when I was done, it was like, you can't watch that right now. You need to help me over here with one child or the other. And, and yep. that's kind of, that was the transition, but now I have to watch hockey. Uh, honey, I gotta, <laughs> I gotta watch the game. It's the job now. It's I'm still working. your job. <laughs> Somebody's got to pay for this, <laughs> you know? So it's been, it's fun. Well, we're glad that you're at least able to watch some hockey with us now and uh, break down some of the Ranger games and uh, this entire season that we have coming up. I mean, it's a very, very exciting season. Um, as you mentioned earlier, you know, Lav has the boys playing really, really well, well so far to start. Um, we'll just take a quick gander at what we've gone through so far. Obviously, they got the road, uh, the road opener in Buffalo under their belt where they look great. Uh, the boys came home last night after taking a loss uh, to go one one on the road trip. But last night at the Garden, you know, get the 2-1 victory. Mika to Kreider for the first goal, which Kreider already four goals on the year, which, I mean, hey, yeah. that's, what, that's what you like to see. Uh, Trocek with the game winner. Uh, and then you got a little fracas after, um, you know, the uh, the ending there. Brian, I guess, first off, um, overall impressions on the Rangers so far this year. Obviously, it's only three games in, running a new head coach, whatnot. Uh, but the core is still pretty much the same. What have you seen so far from them? I mean, I think Panarin is definitely still a wizard, right? Mm -hmm. He he can still do so much. You know, Fox is Fox. He's a top five D in the league, <clears throat> um, no matter what. So, I mean, and sometimes the best D in the league. I, I like. I want to see a step from Miller, and then they're then they're serious. Like it's all. It's always goaltending and defense mm -hmm. and then team defense by extension with your center ice fit and on paper it, it, it's a i mean fans should be excited right like they had did they have 40 shots 40 plus shots against mm -hmm. columbus a couple goals yeah. taken back you know yep. it's early in the year uh you know those things happen they jenner gets a hat trick whatever i mean you hate to lose and you want to start as good as you can you know, last night was a gritty game against a fast team with a lot of talent. And the other thing is those those young teams, right? Like they're kind of riverboat gamblers sometimes. They definitely mm -hmm. they're hard to play against because sometimes they don't play how you're supposed to. And like right. A little all over uh, the place. <laughs> yeah. And 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 so much of it's read and react and team defense is like we, you know, that guy usually this is what you see when you come in on a four check or whatever or regroup and they got a number of guys in Arizona that can that can do individual things. And it's really tough as a five man unit to check that because, you know, Keller obviously has emerged, I think as a star in the league and this kid Cooley's got these wheels, uh, mm -hmm. Michelli, yeah, they've added to, they got Zucker, they have Jersey like that. That's not an easy team. And, and Ingram played really well, but then you go down and, and get a unbelievable pass from Mika, who, in my opinion, if he wore his gear different, would be talked about more as an, as a top tier player. I don't like how he wears his gear, but, <laughs> that's just a small thing Crides isn't going to be forgotten I think every year people think Crides is only going to get 25 goals and every year he comes in better shape than the year before like I don't know why people are counting out Chris Crider he's he just scores goals that's what he it's, does it's funny that you said that because that's something that I've heard around the league is how impressed people are with how in shape Chris Crider is yeah. that he does that he hits just as hard as he did yeah. when he first got into the league it, it, he's he was all speed and power when he first came in and he's learned how to and when to use it every year. He gets more experience with that. I mean, he's a great player in the league and he's going to be again this year. He's just mm -hmm. so committed. He's, he takes care of himself and he just, he really wants to win in New York. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, you know, I, when I see him, I chat with him for a while. He's the same kid. He's, He's been a uh, he's been a great great ranger, obviously, and and you have other guys. I mean, I thought Troach last night was flying. Yeah, and he he has a skating stride that is is so deceptive. He's so powerful, and it was a huge goal that he scored because he's in the right areas. It's a great shot from Panarin, obviously, but they got a number of guys that I think Kako's going to go off. Um, you know, they, they just they have a number of guys. They've got some, you know, Wheeler's going to provide for them, I think, as the season progresses. I, I really like how they're built right now. And I like I like where they're at. They're two and one. It's, you know, that's that's a good start. For all the excitement around the actual team, I 
feel like lo- there should be more excitement about Laviolette as someone who has just been talking to him every day. And after the Coyotes win, I mean, he's sitting there saying, we don't have to be perfect. You know, this was a, a, a gutsy win. We don't have to be perfect three games into the season. I just have really liked what he's been preaching. He's got the team having group hugs on the ice after every morning skate, after every practice. I'm curious what you heard about Laviolette when you were in the league still, just like from word of mouth and and especially the the parts about how he brings teams together and fosters that chemistry, I feel is something that's a very, you know, notable part of his coaching style. Yeah. And I, I love the hire. And because I got to play for Lavi actually for a little mm-hmm. bit in, Na- in Nashville. Mm-hmm. And, and I'll tell you a quick story. Like I went down, I got in late uh, that night after when I got traded. Um, pretty emotional day for me. I was leaving Jersey. My son was going through his medical stuff still. So he he actually that morning went up to Boston with my wife to have an operation. And then I had my daughter. So we just had Declan and Bell at the time. I went to practice. We had a babysitter there and I got the call maybe an hour after she and Declan had left. Uh, My agent called and it was probably three weeks before the deadline. Mm. So we didn't expect it that day. We thought we could get this done before, Mm. um, you know, the devils, we weren't doing good. I knew I was probably going to get moved. And so I had to, my daughter was in the tub with our babysitter. I'm like, Hey, can you, can you stay for like a day? Cause I have to go to, (laughs) Nashville's like, can you get on this flight? I'm like, no. Can you get on this flight? I'm like, no, I got to get on the latest flight you have. And uh, <laughs> so, so I cruised down there. I got in at like 1130. Anyways, I, I'm still like, I'm kind of all over the place. Worried about my son. All this. Barely get any sleep. I get into the morning skate. We have a morning skate. Labby grabs me. And he gives me this speech that I wanted to run through a wall. Yeah. And I, I had to stop him. I said, I, I need you to stop right now. <laughs> Because if you keep talking, I'm not going to get a nap for pregame. I'm going to be too excited, and I'm going to be trash tonight. So he started laughing. But that he is such a great motivator. Yeah. He was uh, – and, and I played like trash that game. But he kept putting me over the boards. And then he talked to me the next morning. He goes, I don't care. I don't care. I'm going to keep playing. And I'm like, all right. And it didn't – I could have gone into a rut, new team, new system. I played like trash at home. Uh, he pulled me right out of it. And he just kept playing me. And it was it was a really good experience. I wanted to go back there. Uh, they made a big signing. I went to a different team. But I, I always appreciated what he brought from just the motivating side. Mm-hmm. And he's obviously a smart coach. He's had great success in the league. He's a Stanley Cup champion. It, 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 uh, it, it's a great hire for them. And he's detailed, too. He, will, he provides that sort of community uh, – feeling I think amongst the guys and and we trust him we trusted him so then when he had to bring the hammer when we were when we were terrible mm. we deserved it we kind of felt like we might have let him down like we, we we're we better than that and yeah. he knows it um, you could tell his passion his work ethic uh, he's really a good I think he's a great pickup for them hmm. well I mean so here's something that I'm kind of curious about from a poor, former player standpoint. The Rangers now on their third head coach since 2018, David Quinn, Gallant last year, and LaViolette. But a lot of the pieces for the Rangers, at least their main core, is the same in that sense. And so I'm just interested, when you bring in a new head coach, how much does, I guess, that affect your style of play? Obviously, strategy-wise, whatnot, but from an individual standpoint, are you changing to kind of adapt to your head coach's personality? Are you changing to adapt to the way that they're trying to play you less ice time, more ice time? How does that whole thing work in terms of being a player? You know what? You see it a lot with teams. They get a new coach and there's success right away. And a lot of times it's, if it happens in the off season, you have two, three months to prepare and train. You really want to make a good first impression, right? It's like auditions almost. Mm. And that's why you get a lot out of these guys. The ones who have uh, longevity and, and long-standing success is when when that wears off, that that, that shiny new car starts to get a little dented. <laughs> you know what's under the hood, right? <laughs> and is there sub is there substance there? Does it still go fast? Is it still can you adapt? Can you tune it up and get right back on the horse? Really, and and that was uh, that's what good coaches will do. As players, if you're there, if the core's there, and it's your third coach with that core, you look at each other and say, "Hey, you know we're better than this." We don't have to – we're not just going to say, oh, it's the coach, it's the coach again. No, it's at that point, you know, 
it's it's time to buck up and play. Like this is not this is not on the coach anymore. And mm-hmm. I think they understand that as well. We talked about this a little bit before we started recording, but one of the things that fans have been going crazy for is this one three one neutral zone trap because the Rangers have been in a one two two for as long as probably you know, since I started watching hockey, which was not that long ago, but still, um, I'm curious what, you know, your impressions are of the one, three, one zone, neutral zone trap, how it's played, what it, what holes there are, the effectiveness. You you mentioned that you played it uh, of some variation of it in Tampa. Well, it's, you know, we could, so many different things that can happen. And, And 10 years ago, you saw a lot more in the neutral zone with a D to D. Mm-hmm. and and now it's just quick up everywhere you're looking for the puncture holes in the defense if there's if there's two d back you're trying to find holes ultimately you want to defend the red line if you mm-hmm. can defend the red line even if you cause a turnover that happens and you get control at your own blue line you don't want to go all the way back and come all the way 200 feet again it's a lot more skating it's some people may say it's five seconds it's eight seconds whatever it is i think at home uh, teams that come into the garden, I don't think it's a secret that the garden ice isn't very good. Mm. It's not on the ground level. There's heat underneath it. That's why it's not good. Mm. They can do whatever they want. It's never going to be good. <laughs> the boards are funky. Things happen. <laughs> There's weird bounces. And as a home team, that's that can play to your strengths. Mm-hmm. Now when the ice and the puck is bouncing and you're a fast team that can get on puck carriers through the neutral zone, if you build a wall at the red line and you have that first forward that can get on, you're going to cause hurried plays. Hurried plays lead to bouncing pucks, and then you get the puck back. Um, it's essentially the same. So what I was saying about the hinge or the D to D, if you have two forwards, the puck goes D to D, the two forwards are here. If they go back over, that D comes up, and now you have one forward, three three players, two forwards and a D, and another D in the back, and that's a 1-3-1 one, one as well. In Tampa, we did it where – you kind of hounded the puck and we, we were bunched up on one side, but the center or the player in the second layer that was in the middle would have to turn. And then that D was always aggressive, but it Mm -hmm. took a lot on the forwards to get back and recover too. So that D could make that stand. Now, Lavi did it a little bit in Nashville with the forwards or the two side players on the walls being aggressive on the penalty kill. Mm -hmm. And, and Dan Muse ran that who is with the Rangers too, I believe. Yep. Um, he ran that and then they implemented it five on five. And it's, it's a different look. Like I was talking about earlier, when you play young skilled teams, there's a different look and you kind of have to gauge what they're doing and why, why it looks different. And then you're not reacting. You're, you're, you're waiting. Now as a, as a team coming in to play New York, that guy's not supposed to be there. Why is he there? I don't have room there. This is the mm-hmm. play we always do. It doesn't work today. Mm-hmm. That gets in your head and a half a second in a hockey rink is, is an eternity. And, <laughs> And they dictate the pace of the game. And if they can do it to a T, it is a lot of work on the the players away from the puck to make sure they're back and covered. If you get it, you transition that much faster. They're going to play in the offensive zone a lot more. And that's the best I can do without drawing pictures. <laughs> the hand movement was very, it was, yeah. it was good. <laughs> I, I was going to say, anyone who's listening to the podcast right now, you, you may be listening, but you're going to want to go on YouTube and check out Brian's <laughs> description. He's, as, as, a, as an Italian myself who talks with his hands, I appreciate <laughs> Brian's demonstrations with his hands. So definitely check that out as well, too. Well, listen, there's so much more to talk about, but first we have to welcome in the great Larry Brooks. Stay tuned. It's coming up next on the Up in the Blue Seats podcast. And now we'll welcome in Hockey Hall of Famer from the New York Post, the great Larry Brooks. And, uh, you know, listen, anyone who tunes into our episode last week, before we had Brian on, we had spoken with Larry about his uh, first time experience with Brian Boyle. And Larry, you know, y- y- you gave us an interesting uh, encounter with him. And uh, there were some words thrown about uh, to stay away from you. But, uh, <laughs> you know, now you got Brian right here with you. And uh, you guys seem pretty good with each other, I guess. <laughs> no, we, we've been good for a long, long time. Actually, it wasn't my first encounter with him. We, we, were, we were talking um, maybe a couple of years into into his tenure. And, 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 and listen, Brian Boyle was always a go-to guy in the locker room. You knew he was going to be straight with you. Um, you knew he was going to be um, honest about the team and about himself. But we were having a conversation uh, one day where he told me that 
when he came to New York, when he was when he was traded to the Rangers by L.A., that his agent had warned him to stay away from me because I, because I was <laughs> trouble. And all I know is that I remember it. And, and, and I, and I mentioned this last week too, when the Rangers made the trade, I said, they shouldn't have made the trade. It wasn't so much because of you. <laughs> <laughs> it was because they were giving up a third rounder and I had wanted them to, to use that third rounder on an offer sheet, the fine, you know, the following season. And, by trading that third rounder, they were going to be kicked out. You know, they were ineligible for an offer sheet. So I'm sure you didn't take it personally. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> but, I, but, but one of the first things I ever wrote about Brian Boyle was, oh, this is a bad trade. <laughs> this is really a bad trade. And here we are. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, listen, the trade happens. I'd never been traded, obviously. I stayed in school for four years and then played parts of two years. Didn't have a great second year in L.A., didn't particularly like the coach in LA. Um, well, I'll leave that alone. But we, I, the trade happened. I was back on the East Coast. My mom was crying. Everyone was all excited. My agent calls Aww. after everything's done and is like, don't worry about what Larry Brooks said, that guy, blah, 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 blah. Other <laughs> choice words. And I was like, who? What? And he goes, oh, no, he just wrote. He wrote how this was a terrible trade for the Rangers. I was like, well, I didn't know that. I never would have known that. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Paul. Um, <laughs> he goes, just stay away from him. I'm like, what's he going to talk to me for? I, you know, I'm trying to just make the team. I just don't want to be in Hartford. Mm -hmm. And that's all it was. And then, you know, we start getting to know each other a little bit. And then we had, obviously, we had torts. And uh, I don't know if anybody knows, but Larry and Torts had a couple run-ins. I don't know if anybody uh, knows. I don't know. And so, I, I mean, listen, as I got to know Larry and I got to know sort of the market, really, I real, I had a lot of, I, have a, I still do have a lot of respect for Larry Brooks and Larry Brooks's work and how he goes about his business. He tries to find the story that he think is, he thinks is, I'm not trying to speak for you, Larry, but in my opinion, it, it, it looks to me as though you're trying to find interesting and important stories and you went about it you weren't necessarily always with the big scrum you, you found different angles and and you know a lot of times I would talk to Larry and no one else would come and talk to me so I was like oh, I get to talk to Larry and get my name in the paper again so I we had a, it was a good respect I thought and then Larry tried to get me a whole bunch of money when I was a free agent he was <laughs> things in the paper about how much I should get and I said I don't even know if that was on the table but call my agent same guy like you see what Brooksy wrote <laughs> So, I I'm mean, curious, I appreciated that. I'm curious, did you guys ever, you know, hear about the infamous Torts Larry showdowns in the locker room? Did you guys like think it was funny? <laughs> yeah, listen, I'm dumb, but I'm not that dumb. And uh <laughs> I'm not stupid either. So we uh we we knew about it. We could hear it sometimes going yeah. on yeah. in the hallway. Like, yeah. like what is happening out there? And uh we might not have a coach tonight because he might be in jail, but uh it's like and larry never backed down mm -hmm. and he he did what he thought was right and i mean listen everybody probably could go back and say i could have said this different or i could have done that different but i, I larry never backed down and I, I i loved it look in a city like new york we're in, we're entertainers as players and he's he's i think he's giving the people what they want well you know thanks i i appreciate that um your team, you know, the, the teams, uh, say, from, you know, 09-10 through when you were here through the finals, 13-14, um, they were, those were teams where, that had players that would sit in the locker room and spend time with you, you know, as, as, as a reporter, as, as a journalist. And I appreciated that. I mean, you could sit down next to anywhere between a half dozen and a dozen guys and they would sit there with you and talk and talk and explain and it wasn't all cliche um it, it you know it wasn't you know controversial it was trying to understand um it was trying to understand what was going on the ice it was trying to understand the dynamic of the team and there were just one there was one player after another you could go to on those teams and i appreciated that i mean you know derek stepan i can't 
I, I, I can't imagine how much time I, I spent sitting next to him talking after games. Matt Zuccarello would come out. Obviously, Hank, you know, was a gold standard, a goaltender who would, who would analyze every game and analyze every save or, or that he made and, and why he didn't make the ones, um, you know, that, that went in. So it was, it was a terrific team to cover. Um, and, you know, going from, from Tortorella to Vino was, you know, was, it was an interesting change in dynamics. It was, it was very welcome on, on, I think all of our sides that, you know, Torts had, had, you know, had, had done very positive things in New York. There's no question about it. You know, he was a very constructive individual as, as a coach, I thought. But, you know, as as comes with just about everybody, except maybe John Cooper, you know, your time runs out at some point. It just, you know, you you need a change. And and so um, those teams were were really good teams. They were, they were good teams and they were good teams to cover. I think we, we had an understanding of whether we were told that or it was the guys before us, but we, you were the vessel between the fans and, and us. And whether we loved the fans, we loved the fans, whether we liked them all the time, <laughs> it was a different story. I remember getting, boot, getting booed out of our building and the Stanley cup final was, was a new one, <laughs> um, but they were frustrated. We were that close and we were frustrated too. Um, you know, we could, speak and and especially with larry or, and, and guys that we really did trust we could say what we thought and he would put it down on paper exactly how we said it and paint the picture of how we said it there's very little out of context so and that's when you, you're going to give answers to reporters when they don't take it out of context don't try to blow it up into something that isn't um just writing what it is and that was you get better answers that way i think you, I, I certainly would give you a better answer that way and and it, it was it lets the fans in on the team and that's what is so important in, in this entertainment business that we're in, in sports you want to know exactly what's going on we did the 24 7 thing i was shocked Tort said yes but <laughs> people come up to me still and talk to me about that he, t- he teased me up one time in it but <laughs> it, it, i'm like it's all so important like we're 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 paid very well to do the thing that we love to do and the people that come and watch us want to know more about us. So we're going to let them know. I feel like that it's such a hot topic nowadays, just because it's so different, the relationship between teams and the media than it was even, you know, when Larry first was covering you on the Rangers, but it sounds like you did have an understanding as a player, whether it was because it was coming from the top down or the players before you, that it is supposed to be, you know, a, a mutual respect relationship because it is about growing the game and just, you know, having more of a reach to the fans. But I mean, I'm sure you had, you know, your your interesting instances with the media over your career as well. Am I wrong in saying that? Uh, you know what? Looking back, I've looked at a few whoever the mm-hmm. uh, hosts or analysts or, or reporters had been like, how do you come up with that question? That doesn't even make sense. To you. <laughs> or like, I just answered that question. Right. And now, and I've tried to, I don't think I ever, hopefully I didn't ever make anybody feel terrible about it, but <laughs> because now I've have to ask questions on TV a little bit. Exactly. It the worst. It is so hard. I did. Yeah. I didn't show. I did a show last week. I asked a 51 second question. <laughs> and then it was some Matthew Kachuk and then his internet cut out and we cut it and, and they were like hey can you just cut that down <laughs> and I've had to go to like the producers and stuff and like if you need me like whatever I do wrong you have to like tell it to me or yell it at me because mm-hmm. this is what my life has been like <laughs> if you like gently suggest something it's gonna just go in one ear and out the other I'm not paying attention to that mm-hmm. like tell me I stunk <laughs> Tell me, don't do that, and I won't do it again. That's the player in you. Uh, it's, I know. I'm like, where's my itinerary when I get down to see right. for the NHL Network? I'm like, yeah. where are we supposed to be right now? Like, my Whatever. itinerary. Just be on the Zoom call in three hours, and you're fine. I'm like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> I, I've, Somebody got asked it. I've got a question for you, actually. Just seeing that that painting, um, yeah, uh, Brian. Which um, which team? Do you most identify with that you played with your in your career? Because I'm just looking at you know that Tampa. Yeah, I I was such a suitcase. scenario, but uh, yeah. which which um, 
Um, you know, which team do you identify with? Do you think? It's it's not just one. I was such a suitcase, but uh, you know, New York for sure is such a huge part of. And it was, I mean, it was long ago, but the longer I get out, it was just and the people that are there still uh, being able to be a part of it still, and then the alumni stuff going back and seeing guys. Uh, Tampa, I've gone down, done some alumni stuff there. That was such a totally different vibe, especially coming right out of the cup final with New York to Tampa, like totally different to the point where like 75 games into the season, I was just talking about it earlier a little bit. Like I was like, when are we going to really start talking about the defense and the structure? And it was just like, no, no, we're rolling. We're getting better. We're rolling. We're rolling. We're rolling. And, and that extended off the ice too. like, you know, I went to Tampa. We had just gotten married. We had our two children down in Tampa. We made some great friendships in Tampa. A lot of those guys are still there in Tampa. So when I go down there, it feels like I really miss it too. We go to Manhattan. It's different. Like, I'm like, oh, I love this place. Like, when well, this is just, remember, remember that time we were single? So it's like <laughs> a lifetime ago. I was like, honey, we weren't married. We didn't have any kids. We just... <laughs> We just went to dinner at 10 o'clock. That was awesome. And now it's like I've been asleep for a half hour at 10 o'clock. <laughs> it, so it's just different phases of my life. But it was, I mean, and a little bit Jersey too, even though it was a shorter time. It was, um, it was so much happened. Yeah. And it wasn't all, it was mostly not good um, to myself, to my son. Um, but being back in that and then having that like three-year buffer where I wasn't going from New York to Jersey and then just being on the other side of the river, but coming back and playing against the Rangers and looking around and being like, I remember this, this was awesome, but now we got to beat them. We got to beat them. <laughs> um, but for sure, you know, the devil's fans were so good to me too. And I just, I look at what the fans did for me and it was really positive in, in almost all the places, LA, they not so much. Cause <laughs> Corey Perry was like winning heart trophies. And I was, I was in college. I was an All-American, but I wasn't. Uh, I was. I wasn't doing anything in the NHL. I was getting traded. <laughs> well, well, you know, you know what? Yeah, I re I remember when when actually the the trade the trade happened. You know, the the LA trade happened, and Glenn started talking about it. Talking about Glenn Saylor. Yeah. Glenn started talking about it. it was at the draft, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he started talking about because you had had a good game at the Garden, <laughs> and I think you played D in that game or, 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 or you played part of that game on D. And I think that was one right. of the, well, he can play D also. And I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> why? Well, so I started my pro career as a defenseman, which yeah. is why part of the reason I didn't sign after my junior year, I, they were LA was like, we don't know where you're going to play. Like, well, <laughs> I do. <laughs> and then like five games into my senior year in college, Jerry York put me at the third line left winger. And I was like, all right, this is not, working out i'm like put me back at center uh and then i ended up playing d in college i played d in in manchester and i was leading our team in goals and i was last in plus minus in the whole league and uh we're all kind of just like what what are we doing here and they moved me back up front and had a great year then the next year after i got sent down we would play hartford and hartford had uh artem anisimov and pa parento having big years yeah and Mark Morris was my coach in Manchester. He was awesome to me. And Scotty Pellerin was the other coach. And Scotty Pellerin was great because he was a big point guy at Maine and played pro for a long time, played the yeah. NHL. And he said to me, do you want to play here and dominate or do you want to go up there and learn how to be an NHL player? And I said, I, I, no offense to you guys, but I don't – I hate it here. I want to come to the NHL. <laughs> and he said, you got to play. You got to check. And he goes, don't worry about scoring. Just check. And so I was every shift in Artie's jersey, not letting them do anything. I ended up scoring a game winner in overtime. And my stats were way different. I wasn't on the power play. I had 17 power play goals a year before. As a 22-year-old kid, I was like, "What? these people are idiots. And what they were doing was teaching me how just to be hyper-focused on playing defense. And so as a centerman with a little bit of defense experience, I – and, and Glenn actually told me that. He goes, you shut down the best line in the American League like three different times. That's why we signed you. So don't worry about power play. Don't worry about points. And it took a while at the NHL level to get effective at that. And I hated it for a little while, but I loved I, – I didn't hate it as much as being in the American League, I guess. <laughs> <Is that what laughs> I 
I never went down. They were very patient with me that first year. I was awful. Yeah. And they were very, very patient with me. Um, Slats, uh, Shoney, Jim Schoenfeld, uh, Sully, Mike Sullivan was awesome. Torts would mm -hmm. tell me once a month, I don't know why you're here. Um, <laughs> but Torts kind of figured out how I ticked. And I said, I'll show you. And, mm -hmm. you know, it worked out. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, after that first year, over the summer, when 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 people were generally doing their lineup projections, you generally were not in them, because I I think no. you know coming to camp, there was an expectation you weren't going to make the team. But that was also the summer that you worked so hard with with Barbara Underhill, right? And um, um, your yeah. skating improved. Yeah, I mean, you know, you you were a different player coming back for your second year. Torch told me point blank. We're getting younger, and uh, I don't see where you fit on this team. Yeah, at my exit meeting after the first year. Not <laughs> all. That was it. Uh, okay, thanks. We'll see you at camp, I guess. If I'm still here, had to make it work. There can't go to three teams in in three years as a young player. And Slats told me to buy speed skates, and Shoney said work with Barb Underhill. So I worked with Barb Underhill because I wasn't buying speed skates, and. Um, I'll tell you what, it was uh, it was intense. We were 27 hours on the ice one-on-one -on -one, uh, over the course of like five weeks. Wow. Not a whole lot of pucks being touched. Just totally breaking down the stride and building it back up. Long hours in the gym. Um, but it came, from, I mean, it came from Torch's message. Like he, It's really, really hard, and then it gets a little easier, but you can't let it get easy. Just keep that same mentality and – yeah, I had a big year. I was petrified because skating, my stride was so much more efficient. I didn't feel like I was able to skate fast, and I was skating way faster. Mm. Um, and had a lot of long conversations with Barb about that. She was so awesome. She still is. She's she's one of the coolest people I've ever met in hockey. Mm. And what she did for me, like I can never thank her enough. Yeah. Mm. Well, Larry, you, put the, okay. you put the work. You actually put the work into it, and and. And so, and, you know, you were how old at that point? 25, 26, 27, yeah. somewhere in there. Yeah. yeah. So, so, uh, 20, so are, yeah, are you, are, are you um, like an example that players, even in their mid 20s, who have, who have been pros for, you know, three, four, five years, can dramatically improve their skating? I mean, is, is or, or is it, is it, not a fair blanket statement. I mean, everybody is different. It's probably personality. Like I was scared for my career, obviously, but even my life, like I was like, this is what I'm going to do. And then they're telling me I'm probably not going to do it. Mm -hmm. And if you get sent down at 25, 26, you're just that guy that goes up and down. Right. And I'm like, it is, it is now, or it is never. And I was petrified. It was a long, lot of long, sleepless nights, to be quite honest. It was, you know, we didn't make the playoffs, so we're done in April. Um, you know, the world championship team wasn't calling for me at my four goals and two assists in 70 games or whatever it was. <laughs> um, I had an injury that didn't even happen on the ice. We are playing right. basketball. <laughs> you know what? You told me that. All, you, you had told me that. And, and My ankle. An injury, like, and you had told me that. And you oh, said, you, you can't use this. You can't use this. <laughs> I mean, and the team could have technically suspended me and not paid yeah. me. We're playing two-on-two -two basketball after <clears> practice, which was, like, awesome. We had some <laughs> games. And I, I went up and landed on Brandon Press foot, and I literally heard the thing pop. So I tore some ligaments. Ended up playing in game 82, that shootout loss to uh, yeah. to Philly. You played well. so much. You had, a, you, had a, you had a big game that game. They threw me on the right wing, which if I have to play wing, I love the right. And we play, I played with Drew. And I was like, I'm back. And they were just like, can you stop and start and penalty kill? I said, yeah. And, you know, we, we uh, they were patient with me then again, too. So a lot of it was like, I owe it to so many people to just make sure I do this. But the amount of stress was <laughs> nuts. And the, and the year didn't start off great. We were running. Uh, we're running our two or three mile tests, whatever it was. And I'm, I'm playing in the exhibition, but I'm fourth line. I, I fought a couple guys and then I'm fourth line again. And I know how Torch uses his fourth line. It was like, I, I have to figure out a way to survive. Yeah. And he comes into Toronto after we lose and he points at uh, Derek Bugard and said, Hey, 
come uh, come tomorrow and we're, you're going to skate some more. And so I looked at him and I go, you need me too? And he goes, no. And then he walked over to me and he goes, stay with it. Don't worry. Just stay with it. And that was the only time he'd done that to that point. And I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> like, am I doing something right? I played six minutes. That's so torts language was, for yes. <laughs> yeah. but So I think I'm destined to just play six, eight minutes and get, you know, five goals again. And, you know, my contract was up. But then, you know, Sean Avery hurt his knee and other guys started. So spots just kind of kept. Yeah. Well, maybe I can fit in there as 13th <laughs> forward or 12th forward. Yeah. Maybe I can make this team. And then the penalty kill started doing really well. And then we we just kind of started rolling. I started playing a lot late in games. I'd playing with Doobie and Callie on the shutdown line, um, playing against the Sedin brothers in, in, at the garden on a one nothing win mm. where it was like great game. But then you look at the chance chart and we gave up like 50 shots. Hank was like <laughs> unbelievable, but it was still like, I finally felt like I was contributing and it started scoring some goals, which mm. was awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Always awesome to score some goals. I can't imagine what that feels like. But, Larry, before we let you go, and, uh, you know, we have plenty to talk with Brian all season, and these stories are just awesome. But I just want to get your quick reaction on the Rangers' 2-1 and start so far. Um, Obviously, big win at home last night. You wrote about how the Rangers have to turn the garden into a house of horror and not just a place that, you know, players think it's cool to play in. But your thoughts so far on the 2-1 and New York Rangers? I think it's. I think it was an encouraging first week. Mm-hmm. Um, and and what what impresses me about the Rangers is how hard they're working to get this system down. It is it is so foreign to them. They've never played anything like this. Anything like a one three one neutral zone lock. Whatever whatever it is. I mean, it started as a in training camp. It started as a lock. And and Brian obviously you know. <laughs> is a lot more knowledgeable about this than, than I am. He did a little but hand it, diagram, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it, it doesn't look like a lock. It looks, looks like it's just a one, three, one trap um, to me now that they're playing and you can see that they are, they are diligent in, in, you know, in, in trying to master the details and it's, and I can only imagine how difficult it is to try and do it in a game. You know, it's one thing to try and do it in practice you're not going full speed. You're, you know, you're not, you know, it's not the same competition, even though they are, you know, they, they under, you know, they do a lot of physical work in, in their practices. They're pretty up-tempo practices. They're um, um, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of battle in the, in the corners for the pucks, but it's not the same as a game. And here they are trying to adapt to something that is again, so foreign to the way they have ever played that I am impressed, you know, you know, I, I am impressed and there, there are going to be breakdowns in games. There are going to be some games where they don't quite have it, but that's what impresses me most about them is there is, is that they took what they said at the end of last year privately about wanting to be coached, about needing to be coached, about needing, you know, needing more detail in their game. And they've taken their words and they and they put it into action mm-hmm. on the ice. This you know this group, I think, was terribly disappointed in itself last year. Everyone was disappointed. It was a major letdown. Not and and again, we've said this you know a million times. We said it once. It wasn't that, that they lost to the Devils in seven games? New Jersey was a big time team. They finished ahead of them in the in the in the regular season. They won the season series. So losing in seven games. You know, when you don't have home ice advantage, you know, it's, you know, it, it's, it, you know, it's not a disgrace. It's just the way they lost. They look so bewildered. They, they it looked like they stopped competing because they were, they were, you know, they were just out of their elements. So they went in, they said, look, we need to be coached. We, you know, we need a, a detail oriented coach. And that's what they got. And there, there's no grumbling about it. There's no, oh, he's on us again. We have to do this. Um, it's not as much fun. There, it seems to me, again, from, from the outside, but it seems to me that there's total buy-in on mm-hmm. this. Now, we're three games in, and let's, <laughs> if it's, you know, it, they should get better at it as the season goes on, so should, there should be even more buy-in. But that's what impresses me most. And, I mean, I think you have some guys who are playing very well. Um, Artemi Panarin is off to a, a terrific um, start. I think, you know, that's very encouraging. Uh, uh, Will Cooley has played very well. 
Um, so you can go down individually looking at guys who have played well. Um, but to me, it's just it's it's that the team is 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 buying into this team concept that I mean, <laughs> like, I, like I wrote the other night after the Buffalo game, I've been watching this team for a like decades and decades and decades. I've never seen a Ranger team play like this ever. You know, I've never seen them coached like this um, ever. There was, you know, Torts had his had one way different than this. But even the way that, you know, that kind of reminds me of the way the 11 12 team bought into the black and blue shirt style of hockey. I mean, you just absorb, you know, shot after shot, but but there was no panic because you knew how to play. The Rangers knew how to play in their own end. So um that's that's what impresses me most about the first week of the season. And well, that's that's pretty much what you want to hear, especially decades, decades, and you're seeing them play a new way for the first time. That's Music to my ears, as long as the winds keep coming. Larry, we appreciate you coming on, and uh, we look forward to talking to you next week. Sure, me too. See you guys. See you, Larry. Larry Brooks, always great. And, man, the stories that the two of you, Brian, have. And, I again, anybody who's listening, tuning in right now, just, just stay tuned for more because there's just so much more coming. Uh, look, guys, it's the end of the show, but we still have uh, three stars to give out. And, um, you know, Molly, who who's your – star so far i don't think it's a who it's a what and that's the rangers penalty kill units have just been i think peter laviolette said it the best just courageous i mean this is a team that's willing to put their bodies on the line and you know you have the guys that have been consistently doing that like ryan lingren jacob truba for the last couple of years but this is a full penalty kill buy-in and you know they fend off that five on three uh after the coyotes win i mean they just it looks good the special teams uh look pretty good so far through the first three games so pk is my star of the week (laughs) love to see it brian star number two who do you got i mean i do love the pk as a pk guy that was fun to watch (laughs) i got Chris Kreider's got four tucks already, four bingos in three games. Scoring goals is hard. I mean, Kreis is my guy, obviously. I've, I've known him a long time, but he uh, he's showing up, and that is a great, great sign for the Rangers. I like it. Number three star for me is going to go to Igor, and <laughs> not just stopping his fourth penalty shot, four for four in his career, ice in his veins, Shesterkin, but he was a defender. At the end of the garden match, <laughs> and he, he he blocked all some guys. He got into the front. You rarely see the goalies get in there, and but I love to see it. You know, defending his guys and those scrappy coyotes and, and getting in there. So I got to give it to Igor. You know, Brian, you're not a a, a, a you know a stranger of of fights. What'd you make of that one there at the end? You don't love to see it in real time. Uh, you're you, you know they're so good. And he's such a good part of that, the big part of that team, really. Uh, they're going to go as far as Igor takes them. Yep. Once in a very blue moon, it's fine. Because if he does it again, you know, anytime soon, that initial shock of when a goalie gets into the scrum as a player, you kind of – you don't really get into it with the goalie. There's a certain respect there. You know, he has all those pads in the front. He's got nothing in the back. And we know how important goalies are, and we got to protect them and all that crap. Um <laughs> If he comes in again, people will be ready. So I just I would be wary of uh, if if I'm you know Jacob Trouba or something like, hey, thanks, man, because respect factor through the roof, right? But don't do it again, please, because you need to, you know, you need we to need be you. We need you in that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. So I mean, cool to see, super entertaining, a lot of hugging going on, a lot of gloves staying on, but um, except Jersey, who played half the game, must have been must have been real tired after that, but. <laughs> Um, uh, it was good. This passion there out of conference game, like won't play again till yeah, was it, for a March, while. maybe. Yeah. yeah. Um, cool to see, cool to see from the coyotes too. They've been, uh, they've had some tough press over the last couple of years and they were, they were impressive. Hmm. Well, we'll see if that does carry over into March. We can come back to this episode and reference this, and we'll see what happens. But until then, it's time to put a bow on episode 128 of the Up in the Blue Seats podcast from the New York Post. Of course, thanks to Jake Brown for producing the show. You can catch up on all episodes of the podcast by subscribing to it to Up in the Blue Seats on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. If you're watching on the uh, YouTube right now, the New York Post YouTube page, just drop a, a comment right here, thumbs up. 
what do you think of Brian's performance? I mean, come on now. Like, not not bad for a first time, I'd say. But uh, we'd love to hear your comments. I'm sure uh, all of us do here. So we appreciate it. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter uh, or X. We established last week. This is no, it's house. Twitter. It's Twitter. Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> Twitter in the house. I refuse. <laughs> there is no X. Uh, Miss Molly Walker. That's uh, two L's, two E's uh, at Molly Walker. Uh, and of course, Brian Boyle, you know, got to give him a follow on there too. Bry Bros. Browse, not bros. Browse, baby. The brows. Browse. He's got the brows. Browse. 22 yeah. double deuces. And of course, I'm Andrew Hartz at Andrew Hartz. No E, just the A. But for Brian Boyle, Larry Brooks, Molly Walker, I'm Andrew Hartz. We look forward to seeing you next Wednesday for another episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening to Up in the Blue Seas. We'll talk to you next time. Later.